interesting thing about Krista is that she grew up in a town called Farmland, Indiana. And in Farmland, Indiana, she actually lived on a farm. That's a little on the nose. So please, everyone welcome Krista. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Um, thank you, Jared, and thank you everyone so much for having me. Um, I'm Krista Watts. Um, I actually grew up on a farm outside of the town of Farmland. Um, and But I'm currently the Vice Dean for Operations at the United States Military Academy at West Point. Uh, up until about a month ago, I was the Program Director for the Operations Research and Statistics Program in the Department of Mathematical Sciences, also at West Point. Um, and today I'm going to kind of interchangeably use the terms West Point and USMA um, or United States Military Academy synonymously. And today I want to talk a little bit about some of the teaching and pedagogy research that has been conducted at West Point recently. West Point uh, sort of has a really unique situation where a lot of the attributes of the academy are such that we can create almost a randomized trial or a cluster randomized trial in many of our courses. Um, but first, let's give a little background uh, about West Point itself. USMA is a four-year undergraduate institution which, with approximately 4,400 students. Uh, all students must choose at least one academic major. This is actually a relatively recent development. So majors were not offered at the academy for most of its history, not up until about the 1980s. Uh, and even into the 90s, students weren't required to have a major. So uh, for instance, I'm a class of 1996 graduate, um, and my classmates could elect to have a field of study rather than actually majoring in a subject. Um, all students at West Point essentially have a full ride. Uh, there's no tuition but all students are also required to attend all classes. They must graduate generally within four years and they have a five year service obligation to the United States Army upon graduation. So we don't necessarily look like a typical liberal arts school. Um, right outside my office um, right now is a giant howitzer field artillery piece because it's branch week. And so literally if I walked out the front door of my building, there are tanks and artillery pieces everywhere. At the, like right now. Um, so, you know, but in many ways we are very similar to other selective liberal arts colleges. We have similar admissions rates, student to faculty ratio, class size, test scores, racial breakdown is pretty similar to other schools. Um, we have a lower female to male ratio in general, where we have about 20% of our students are female. Uh, we have a lower percentage of non-resident aliens and a bit more geographic diversity than you might see elsewhere. Uh, so what makes us suited to do this type of research? Uh, first of all, we have a very large core curriculum. And so on this slide, this shows you the basic curriculum that all students must take to graduate. Uh, everyone must have a minimum of 43 credit hour or more uh, academic courses. So if you look over here, you see that there are actually 50 uh, courses on this slide, but that includes the seven physical education courses and three military science courses, which are not considered as part of the 40 academic course minimum. Of these 40 courses, 27 of them are common courses that all students take, what we would call our core curriculum. Uh, they have 13 required STEM courses and 14 required humanities and social science courses. Um, now, when I say they're common courses, not every student takes the exact same courses. So, for instance, to meet their language requirements, some students will take Portuguese, other students might take Persian. Um, students who have a stronger background in mathematics might test out a single variable calculus and take multivariable calculus instead, et cetera. But you still end up with several courses that have close to 2,000 students who take them every year. And so 1,000 students that are spread out into sections of 15 to 18 students each. And so you can do the math, but that's a lot of sections of calculus. Um, and then additionally, as you might expect at a military academy, the curriculum within these courses is a bit more standardized um, than you might find at other places. We tend to have a common syllabus, common text, uh, common assessments. And the student's time is also highly structured. 
So that can provide an environment where we can actually test the effects of different policies on you know, student learning or whatever we're interested in. Today, I'm gonna highlight three studies that I'm personally aware of that have been done recently, but there are many, many more. Um, and first, I wanna highlight the study Attribution Bias in Major Decisions, Evidence from the United States Military Academy. This paper was done by, among others, Rich Patterson, who's an economist currently at Brigham Young, but uh, formerly a member of the Department of Social Sciences here at West Point. And as you might guess, these first two papers are both done by economists, and they did not use R for their statistical analysis. Um, you did, Jared didn't mention STATA as one of the programs that we welcome, but I'm sure that that was included. Um, so they define attribution bias as instances in which individuals misattribute the influence of a prior temporary state to a fixed property of their utility over a good or activity. Okay, what's that mean? Well, for example, the thirst that's experienced while you're sampling a new drink can actually have a significant influence on a person's stated willingness to drink it again in the future. Um, and so here in this study, they're looking for attribution bias when deciding a major in college. So specifically, they test whether student fatigue influences a student's graduating major at West Point. Um, so prior studies have shown that students exhibit diminished performance in early morning courses and in courses that are scheduled immediately after one or more back-to-back -back courses. So this study takes advantage of the fact that cadet schedules are randomly assigned given their courses. So once we know what courses they're taking, the actual assignment of classes to hours is random. Um, it also matters a little bit whether or not they're a Division I athlete because they usually have the afternoons or at least one hour in the afternoon off. Um, here we test two major endpoints. First, if being assigned to a first period section of a required course, influences the choice to major in a corresponding subject. So for instance, if I have the core economics course first hour, am I more or less likely to choose econ as a major? Um, and I should note here that first period here starts at 7.30 in the morning. Um, the second endpoint is whether the variation in the number of back-to-back -back courses that students are assigned immediately before a required course influences their major choice. So again, if I have econ third hour, but I also have a first and second hour class, um, am I more or less likely to major in economics than if I have econ third hour, but maybe I have second hour off? Um, and you know, I'm sure we can all remember back to college. It was a little further back for me than probably most of you, um, but I recall sitting through what seemed like endless hours of back-to-back -back courses. And there are a couple of characteristics about USA, my, sorry, USMA that makes this study possible. Um, student time and schedules are highly structured in their first three semesters. They're generally gonna take the same courses and they don't really have control over the order of the courses they take. Um, at the time this study was conducted, courses were all 55 minutes long and they only started at one of six times throughout the day, starting with that early 7.30 class and going to the last hour that starts at 3.05. Um, but courses are not actually taught on fixed days of the week. So again, at this time, courses rotated and you would have a course Monday, Wednesday, Friday of one week, and then Tuesday and Thursday of the next week. So every course that you have would be taken every day of the week throughout the semester. Um, and we have had significant changes to our schedule since this study was conducted. So if anybody's been here recently, you know, these, the conditions that this study was conducted under don't really hold any longer. Um, and, but particularly important to this research is also that students aren't allowed to choose their own schedule. And so the registrar's office just down the hall assigns the time um, of day and the instructor for each course. And this can be viewed as sort of random assignment to course scheduling, and it's a key component of being able to do studies like this. Um, when this study was conducted, students declared their major during the first semester of sophomore year. Um, about 29% of students chose a major that corresponds to one of the general ed or core courses that were taught in their first three semesters. And 83% of students graduate with the major that they chose first in their sophomore year. Um, there are also pretty strict disciplinary consequences 
um, for missing classes. So differential attendance is not an issue here. Um, so we looked at almost uh, 19,000 students from 2001 to 2017 um, and over 200,000 student course observations. Um, and so I, I'm just going to give you one of the models in the interest of time. Um, and this is the model that they fit that looked at the question of whether having a first hour subject influence a, a student's decision to major in a corresponding uh, subject. And so here we have why sub I C E J T S is an indicator for whether an individual that was in course, uh, sorry, individual I in course C with Professor J during time slot S of year T chose to major in a corresponding subject area. Um, F of ICTS is an indicator whether the course is an early morning course or not. So that's 7.30 a.m. start time. X sub I is a vector of student characteristics that includes age, sex, race and ethnicity, SAT math, SAT verbal, and leadership scores. This sum here um, is a vector of the average characteristics of a student's peers within a course. And then, you know, really important to this analysis is this course roster fixed effect, R sub IT. And that's a fixed effect for the particular combination of courses that a student is taking in a given semester. Um, and due to the rigid structure of when students take courses, this roster fixed effect sort of subsumes any um, semester fixed effect. And then by comparing the outcomes of only students who share the exact same combination of courses, we can really isolate the, isolate the effects of scheduling. Um, this gamma C is a course fixed effect. So, you know, is it calculus or world history? Phi is an instructor fixed effect. Lambda is a year fixed effect. Um, and these variables are intended to isolate the fatigue that might be generated by early morning assignment. Um, and so what did we find? Well, you're actually 10% less likely to major in a subject related to an early morning course. And each additional course, if you have these courses that are back to back immediately preceding a class, reduces the probability that students major in a related subject by 12%. Um, and so we, we try to use this to push back our start time a little bit of classes, but so far we're not seeing that. Okay. Uh, the second study that I will look at is the impact of computer usage on academic performance. And here we really looked at more of a randomized trial. Um, and this paper was done by another one of our economists, Dr. Susan Carter, Vice Dean for Academic Affairs, whose office is right through there. Um, and they note that anecdotal evidence suggests that professors and teachers are increasingly banning laptop computers, smartphones, and tablets from their classroom. And what they did was evaluate the effects of an experiment that randomly allowed students access to laptop and tablet computers during introductory um, economics course. And in the interest of time, let's move on to our treatment and control groups. Uh, treatment one, students were permitted to use laptops and tablets without restriction. It's treatment two, they're only permitted to use tablets that had to be flat on their desk. And then the control, um, laptop and tablet usage were prohibited. And again, there are some things here that that um, are unique to West Point that really allowed them to execute this study. First of all, there's a direct link between West Point student performance and post-graduation employment. So the higher a student ranks in their graduating class, um, that increases their chances of receiving their first choice of military occupation and duty location upon graduating. Um, and additionally, all students at West Point are on equal footing in terms of access to educational resources. Uh, so they're all required to purchase uh, computers and tablets, or at the time, and tablets, and each academic building is equipped with wireless internet access. So they divided the classrooms into control or one of the two treatment groups. Um, and then they randomized the classrooms to either control or treatment. But professors did have the discretion to stop a student from using computer device in any of the groups if they were being a distraction. Um, and again, we have this identical syllabus, textbook, etc.
And so, you know, again here, this is the model that we fit where Y sub IJHT is the final exam score of student I, professor J, class hour H, semester T. Um, ZJHT is an indicator for an individual being in a classroom which allowed the laptops or tablets. X sub I is the individual controls. Kappa is fixed effects for each combination of professor and semester and lambda's fixed effects for the combination of class hour and semester. And so, you know, by concluding these semester and professor controls, we're really comparing students within the same semester while also controlling for the mean difference in academic performance. Um, and this study actually did find that permitting computer devices in the classroom uh, reduces final exam scores. Um, and this was nearly identical for classrooms that uh, permitted laptops and tablets or the classrooms that only permitted the modified tablet usage. Um, and this computer usage was most detrimental to male students as well as students who entered with a high GPA. And then the last thing that I'm going to talk about today, the third study, is the impact of um, academically homogeneous classrooms for undergraduate statistics. And this was a study conducted by our very own uh, Dusty Turner um, and his partners in crime were Jim Ploys and Chris Collins in um, our introductory province stat course. We had about 580 students across four hours. And when we talk about, we talk about sectioning by ability. And I use the term ability very loosely. What we're really talking about is prior demonstrated academic performance. Um, so that was our treatment group. We have, throughout the history of West Point, or at least you know the last few decades, um, we've kind of come and gone where at some points there was a lot of emphasis on sectioning by ability, and at some points it was almost forbidden. Um, and so here we, we were in an environment where the department leadership kind of let us do what we wanted. And um, so we had half of our, our sections were sectioned by ability and half were random assignments. Um, we, the course was only taught over four hours, um, and so the ability was determined by this predictive model, and I'm, you should really read this article because they put a lot of effort into coming up with these predictive models um, and, and trying to determine how well we expect a student to do in course, um, and that's kind of really the interesting part, uh, maybe, but it's not what I'm talking about, so you should go read the article or talk to Dusty afterwards. Um, and But they considered the previous math courses taken and academic program scores. But not every instructor was assigned to both treatment and control. So for instance, I only taught one section. So I was only assigned to the treatment group. And then they analyzed the grade on um, course-wide graded events, so exams and, um, and our final. Here's um, a breakdown that looked at a few different endpoints, but here we see in red the randomly assigned sections and in blue the ability group sections. And these, you know, randomly assigned sections where they are, are binning them by what ability group they would have been in. And, you know, I think you can just look at this graph and see it doesn't look like there's a whole lot going on here. Not a lot of difference between um, the red and the blue. And, you know, that's what they found. There was no difference in the average grade between groups. Um, there was no difference, you know, at any ability level. So maybe we, we thought, well, maybe it helps students who are at lower abilities or it helps students who are at higher abilities, but it really didn't. And even when they controlled for um, the average grade, um, the predicted grade, still no difference in average grade. I will tell you, though, that I personally prefer teaching a group that's more academically homogeneous, it's much easier to prepare and sort of relate to, to a group like that. But it turns out maybe the students don't actually fare better. Uh, so here are my references. Uh, these were the first, first two talks, or uh, first two studies I mentioned. Um, and then the third, or sorry, yeah, the third study from Dusty and Cohort. Um, so, Thank you very much. Um, I will, you know, I hope that you enjoyed the talk and you can get a hold of me and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks. Great.
thank you very much for being here. And hopefully you'll be able to stick around and um, uh, check out some of the other talks. We are now ready for our next presenter.